Chris, <laughs> what, what is, stop the record. Well, hello and welcome to another Accession Everything Service Management podcast. Thanks for joining us today. And today we're taking a slightly different slant where we're talking with a service management tool set provider and one of which that Accession specifically don't partner with, but it's always interesting to hear from the, the wider, um, what would you call that, service management ecosystem. We're joined by Chris Forster from Alemba. I'm very, very keen to talk to Chris about Alemba's successes around the healthcare space specifically, but um, also across other verticals. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, co-star, some might say, Sunil Duggal. Say hi, Sunil. Hello, everybody. <laughs> wow, well, the, the, the enthusiasm levels, we'll tweak that in post-production. And Chris, great to have you with us. Thanks for taking some time out of your day to speak with us. Chris, if you'd like to give the audience a, a bit of a quick introduction to yourself, then we'll, we'll get into the conversation. Yeah, hi guys and uh, hi everyone. Uh, so yes, yeah, so my name's Chris Forster. So I'm a technical account manager um, at Alemba. Uh, I've been with Alemba now for uh, around 12 years, so uh, a, a fair old tenure. Um, so I was actually a, a previous customer of um, Alemba um, back before 2012 uh, for a finance company. We were implementing uh, Infra uh, Enterprise as it was known back then. Um, I spent a few years at Alemba doing uh, consultancy, so uh, in the professional services team, actually, you know, rolling out deployments to customers as part of projects. Um, did a brief stint in pre-sales, so lots of tender writing and documentation stuff. And then All for the, the fun past stuff, few years, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> lots of paperwork and uh, yeah, lots of long nights uh, get, getting stuff done by deadlines for sure. Um, and then for the past uh, few years, um, yeah, I've been the technical account manager. So my main responsibilities are looking after um, the customers and their contracts, really just helping them get the most out of uh, the tool. I'm their kind of first point of call for commercial stuff, licenses, and you know, any new stuff that they might want to explore or um, see see how uh, Alamba might be able to help them. Fantastic. Somebody you had a question queued up right or um as, as, as always dan yeah um, good stuff so chris thanks first of all of all for joining us so um i'm just gonna if it's all right just um perhaps set the scene a little bit so um alemba is in some ways a sister company i think to sunrise is that correct you're both owned it, by i think volaris, volaris. Group. correct um, and yes. Valaris are quite interesting. And we have talked to David Bullivan of Sunrise previously, and he's told us that Valaris is quite interesting in the sense that it likes to keep its uh, member organizations um, small, nimble, customer centric. Um, it's not really in the business of merging um, to create sort of super big, um, you know, organizations. So, um, yeah. what I think, um, has happened over the last probably, I don't know, 10 years or something is that, um, at the top end of the market, you've had service now sort of break free of its BMC shackles and, you know, pretty much dominate that sort of enterprise space. But in the mid market, um, there's been new entrants, people like Freshworks have come into the, the market. Um, and others, um, and it's quite a competitive space. So I think the thing that we really wanted to try and get into in terms of today's conversation was actually how as a sort of mid-market vendor like Alemba, right, how do you differentiate in different sectors and, you know, show your customers in that space that actually you offer them something that's perhaps a bit different to the others. Um, and so we decided, as Dan mentioned earlier on, to focus quite specifically in and around healthcare and the NHS, because I think Alemba has quite a strong foothold in, in that space, doesn't it? So long-winded intro to the first question. The first question really is, you know, so, so talk to us a bit about what you think makes the NHS uh, a different sector. What are some of the things that are unique about the NHS or healthcare um, as as compared to other sectors, perhaps more commercial ones or other, you know, governmental, you know, sectors, etc. 
So I guess it's a sort of a question around sort of set the landscape really in terms of how you, um, you know, see that space. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so the 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 Valaris thing is you know quite interesting, as you say. We um, you know we're owned by by Valaris and we run autonomously, and they're a sister company, but operate independently and in, and even in competition with Sunrise, which is quite a unique thing to 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 do in mm. that in that particular instance. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, Alembra as a uh, as a whole, um, you know, we were founded in two thousand seven, um, coming from uh, Infra Enterprise uh, previously, who uh, you know, started in Australia, kind of you know in the '90s. So it's a very, very well established um, tool, but has been moved around through various companies throughout the years. Which is why the Alemba name is maybe not as proficient or prevalent as some of you know some of the others that have been around for such a long time as well. Uh, you know, there's, there was a a brief stint where um, it was owned by EMC, pushed out into VMware, and it was VMware Service Manager for a while, and then into uh, Alemba service management. So, um, yeah, quite a, quite a long and rich history there, which is, um, kind of leading to, you know, kind of what the answers around, you know, where do we, uh, you know, how do we, you know, help the customers and, uh, uh, and how, how do we fit in with that? It's just the, you know, the amount of history that's in there and the amount of functionality that, that kind of goes through there. Now, um, healthcare has been, as you, as you mentioned, uh, one of our, uh, you know, strong areas, um, uh, throughout throughout the globe because we do operate globally um uh you know along with the nhs we've got other healthcare organizations throughout the world and obviously healthcare in different countries varies uh you know sometimes quite significantly to the nhs yeah. you know if we're talking about the nhs uh, you know specifically uh you know for anybody that's not <laughs> familiar from around the world you know they're a, a public sector rather than you know a, a profit centric one so you know their funding and finance and financing you know all comes from for, for, from public uh, public finances, and you know they use that to provide cover to you know anybody that needs it um, to either minimise or completely you know get rid of got rid of that 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 cost. So they've got some you know unique challenges. Uh, you know as they've got uh, you know an ever aging kind of population, increased demand, things coming in from left field like COVID, <laughs> you know pandemics, you know ever evolving kind of technologies and issues and uh you know things like that so um you know they 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 in themselves as well have got a you know quite unique um you know regulatory quality account accountability standards to adhere to so they've got a you know a lot on their plate to look after and you know how we kind of really help out is by um you know trying to understand the challenges that each of the uh the NHS trusts have and try to work collaboratively with them to be able to find some solutions because even though the NHS is you know a, an organization as a whole some of the trusts do work quite kind of uniquely and uh, and independently and I think there is a push actually and we'll probably get onto this in a in a while as to how they can collaborate more because I think there is quite a push within the within the organization to to have more collaboration between the trusts hmm. I I wasn't aware by the way of the history um, of Alemba so that's that's good to know. Yeah. Wasn't aware that you know the tool set had been around for quite yeah. such a long time, and I suppose that you know that um, uh, tradition, that legacy, that history that you've, you've you know you've talked about, there's there's going to add to your I, I guess overall proposition. Um, uh, so do you just um, do you actually um, then provide uh, solutions to healthcare organisations outside of the UK as well? Amongst your yeah. Uh, can I just can I just put a bolt yeah, onto that question as well? Because I was going to pick up on that. It's very interesting. You mentioned about the, the healthcare models, you know, the NHS being free at point of care, whereas others, the American healthcare service, are vastly different, almost the other way around. Do you find or what can you share in terms of experiences from these overseas healthcare organizations in the way that they operate? And how that can, you know, have, have there been learnings or experiences that can be drawn from that, that that you can wrap into or bundle into the kind of offerings for? Let's let's just pick on the NHS still. So to say, well, you know, we've seen this organization in X country tackle this challenge in this way. It's worked really well. We think you should you would be able to benefit from doing something similar. Are there, you know, are there examples like that that you could share? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's a, that's a common question, not right. just in healthcare, but throughout all different kind, you know, types of absolutely, types yeah. of markets and, and commercial sectors where you know nobody's looking to reinvent the wheel. They're looking to you know utilize kind of experience from you know various other various other people. And you know, being in the industry that we're in, um, we get a lot of exposure to a lot of different types of organizations with a lot of different. Um, you know, use cases, cultures, age groups, um, you know, maturities, and the consultants that we have that help customers implement the system, um, you know, I've got kind of years worth of experience. The tenure across Alembra is, is, is quite, quite high, you know, kind of, you know, you're talking probably the average is around eight or nine years, I guess, throughout the wow, entire okay. organization. So, you know, quite, quite a, quite a good, uh, quite a good one. So we've got that experience and the guys that are in that team, you know, deal it deal day in day out with all different types of customers. So they'll grab that, you know, that that those bits of information. We'll add it to a kind of a central pool of, you know, useful information that we'll share out. And you know, we uh, we provide customers with the facilities of being able to kind of promote that stuff as well uh, with us. So our marketing team work quite closely to produce things like case studies, so people can just publicly get some of this information and make it available to them. See how others, you know approached various different things rather than, you know, starting from scratch or with a blank piece of paper. So certainly it helps, you know, when you've got uh, an engagement with a member that you've, you know, got that that consultant with you that will help out and uh, and uh, and feedback on some of the the bits as you're, you know, kind of giving giving the business requirements, kind of feeding back on that and going, okay, well, this is what worked best, you know, previously, or here's a couple of different options. You know, what, what, what do you think will work best for you given the circumstances? So, um, so, yeah. Any specific use cases come to mind, Chris? Not to put you on the spot. Um, yeah, I mean, a, quite quite a popular one, for instance, is um, change request processes and new employee onboarding. Um, right. They tend to differ quite drastically between organisations, funnily enough. Even though you think you know it's it's probably quite standard, right? You know, there's a there's a framework yeah. in ITIL for change management, and it says you should do these certain things. But you know, it's all around how much. Um, you know, if a change specifically, how much risk are you willing to take? You know, so how many approvals do you then need? Who needs to approve it? You know, because all that extra uh, stuff that you might need then takes extra time, such as manager yeah. approvals need managers to then do it and review it. And are you willing to sacrifice that, in, you know, to, to, to increase some risks, for instance? Um, and new starters, you know, they, they can um, vary wildly between different organizations as well. What kind of you know, uh, employee checks and backgrounds need to happen, which departments get involved, you know, who even, who even kicks off the process. Sometimes it's HR, sometimes it's IT that that, that say, oh, there's a new starter, you know, in a, in a, in a place. So, um, so yeah, you know, having some, uh, you know, some, some previous experience of that and being able to kind of collate that and say, okay, well, this is what works best. And sometimes what you'll get presented with is a, you know, massive A1 sheet of paper, or even <laughs> the best one was just an entire wall board of just a process with thousands of boxes and just thinking, you know, do you need all of this? You know, uh, you know, which steps can we condense down and actually, you know, to, to get the end deliverable, do you actually need all of this stuff? Um, so that that's quite a lot of what we do is kind of, you know, try to, free up that overcomplication of uh, of process and just streamline things to make it you know as efficient as possible. I, I'm sure you've just hit there on something that's very, very at the forefront of many people's minds in particularly the NHS, which is onboarding um, and offboarding, um, but onboarding more particularly because, you know, if you have to bring in a locum, if you have a new starter, you know, um, that's providing clinical care actually they're really doing their job when they're in contact with patients right when they're actually delivering their expertise to solve problems that people have um, and if they're sat around because the paper process is painfully slow right they're not actually doing the job that they are paid to do and that has a broader impact then doesn't it in terms of the overall standards at the NHS is, for example, meeting. So I imagine that that probably, Chris, is when you when you do engage with NHS customers, that's probably up there in the top three challenges, right, that you talk mm -hmm. about every time. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And, um, you know, like I say, one of the challenges to begin with is just knowing that there's a new employee coming, particularly for IT, because sometimes, you know, they, 
that the person will arrive and they'll be like, right, well, I'm sat in front of, you know, let's say, a patient or a customer or, or, or whatever, and I've, I, I haven't got a laptop. And I, you know, I started today and IT will be like, well, we didn't even know about it. So, you know, it's figuring yeah. out there, you know, who's responsible for, you know, kind of notifying that, you know, how can we, you know, maybe do that notification automatically from a recruitment system, sending across the information, you know, so that it, that it's not manual, it doesn't get missed. It's not a, you know, an extra job of just copy and paste data from one system to another. Um, so yeah, it's figuring out all of that stuff. And again, just making it seamless as well, because nobody wants to be sat there, you know, filling out forms for new employees for, you know, something like the NHS because of the amount of, you know, the massive workforce that they've got. I can imagine they've got, you know, hundreds and hundreds of these, maybe thousands of these things that, you know, that they need to uh, kind of process all of the time throughout the year. So um, yeah, you know, so sorting that out and making that, that process as seamless as possible throughout because it involves so many departments as well not just hr not just it but there's you know security there's you know physical access there's facilities you know if they need to uh you know a desk and and you know kind of or, a locker or something like right that. yeah yeah so um so yeah just you know multitude of departments that need to get involved and a lot of coordination and uh you know um so it's it's just you know kind of overseeing the management of that as slickly as possible without anybody having to oversee the management of it because you know um so, someone just sat there pushing things along where they're not moving doesn't add too much value they're just facilitating unblocking of stuff so uh you know which which if you can avoid the blockages in the first place is you know is of benefit we we, we find in our conversations and Sonal, i'm sure you'll, you'll have something to add to this is that the joiner or that, that kind of employee on on offboarding process is is like some very complex quadratic equation that nobody can really kind of get to solve fully just because of all of the variables that are there you know you mentioned in the nhs right the trust to trust there can be subtle or not so subtle differences that then really throw a you know what works really well over here for one reason you know quite an appropriate or correct reason wouldn't work specifically very well over there it's um it's something we we do have a lot of conversations around I, I, I agree yeah. with you, but I, but I wonder whether this perhaps leads us on to our next topic, really, which mm -hmm. is around how you, how you know, we, ITSM, IT, perhaps more broadly, it, you know, is traditionally seen as a cost center um, in the NHS. You know, if you look at the hierarchy of um, spending, it's always going to be somewhere down at the bottom. Why? Because it's sometimes many degrees removed from actually delivering that patient care. And that patient experience. Um, so I guess one this this is an example, perhaps, Chris, of you know of how you can evidence the value that IT can bring, and how you can develop a business case for investment in better service management capabilities. So I, I, I guess the the question I, I, you know for you is really you know what what other use cases are you seeing that kind of directly you know impact on that business case. Um, for investment you know in, in in service management technology what else do you see that's important yeah so i mean firstly it's it does draw the short end of the straw sometimes because they get sometimes lumped with costs that are not necessarily to facilitate the it department you know underlying licensing costs and uh you know equipment and things like that will instead of being charged to or cross charged to a credit department you know get get put into an it budget which uh, you know, which which provides challenges within uh, you know within themselves. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the the key thing is to really just understand the challenges, um, objectives, and ambitions of what of of, of what you what you've been able you know, what you need to do. Uh, you know, if you provide options at various different levels of budget, you know, to understand the scope. I, uh, you know, highlight some risks of doing certain things, um, understand resourcing, how to communicate and engage with, you know, with the business, you can get a, you know, some, some valuable solutions um, there that are kind of tailored to, you know, kind of the, the, the unique needs there. Um, you know, we see a lot of organizations that are trying to adopt um, more service management practices throughout other areas of the business. So that being facilities, human resources, even things like um, accounts payable and receivable now, you know, uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing actually over the last couple of weeks is, weeks, years, 
has been um, rolling out to additional departments in the uh, in the NHS where they're using you know anything from color coded emails to sticky notes to manage a task list. Um, so going in and just doing kind of the basics of what IT service management has been doing for quite a while, which is you know incident and service request management, utilizing that similar functionality and just bolting it on, but set you obviously segregating the data wherever needed. Um, but it also allows you to be able to share information as needed if using if you're using the same system. Um, and what I see with the NHS as well is they're going through a, um, a kind of a process of tool evaluation and seeing where can they actually utilize a tool they've already got and use it more rather than, you know, go out and just have lots and lots of different tools. You know, there's obviously many benefits around that of being able to share knowledge and experience and usability and, you know, people that might move job roles then have already got experience in using particular tools, you know. No, nobody expects to, you know, join a join a new job and, you know, use a use an email system that nobody's ever heard of before anywhere, right? right. You, know, you expect to use Gmail or Outlook or, you know, you know, something else of, of a similar similar vein. So, you know, it has kind of numerous benefits there. So, so yeah. So, um, I mean, yeah, the the, the the there's various different things that the uh, you know that I see the the NHS doing there in terms of getting that that value out of out of tools, and there's various different ways that they can approach it. Mm. There's definitely a lot of kind of talk around consolidation, so using what you've got to do other things, and equally standardization, so around mm. processes, you know, let's use the on-offboarding process as an example again, to, to gain that economy of scale. And, you know, great point you make about you wouldn't go and work, or you wouldn't typically expect to go and work for an organization and say, well, you know, here's a new email client, you know, we're using Lotus Notes here. Whereas, whereas everybody else in the world's on Office 365 or Gmail, or, but it's 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 interesting to um, kind of see that they're taking that direction now, um, or have been for a while, arguably within the NHS. I think that the challenge is, as you know, as you said earlier, Chris, the scale of the organisation. I think, like the second largest employer in the world, I, I believe I read at some point. Um, yes, something like that. Yeah, yeah. You know. I, I think you have that challenge as well that. Well, whilst you know conceptually you have you know ITIL as a framework across different trusts because they have different geographical considerations, they specialize in different you know areas of clinical need. They you know might be primary or secondary care trusts. That that actually the use cases are different, um, and bringing everyone on the journey together mm. in order to achieve consolidation is um, difficult very difficult very difficult especially as i guess traditionally there's been so much disparity and diversity in procurement right you, you know i mean uh, dan um recent or last year i think it was did a freedom of information request for you know itsm solutions in use in the nhs alemba did scored very highly in in that but actually it was unbelievable how many different tools were out there wasn't it um, yeah i was i was absolutely well, I'll say absolutely gobsmacked, but I was very, very surprised to see that, you know, there's over 30 different platforms yeah. in use, you know, across the NHS, which, you know, okay, it was, it was eye opening and um, certainly certainly would lead a compelling story. Of, uh, there's there's a, an opportunity for either A, consolidation or B, standardization there of some, to some degree. And I think that yeah. speaking from a personal point of view, that the trusts, especially ones that are geographically close to each other, you know, if they could all kind of pool resources, to put it very, very simply, all get on board with a um, common platform, then the wealth of data and everything else, the economies of scale there would be certainly advantageous and, and of benefit. But as you've just pointed out, Son Ellen, as I'm sure many of our listeners can appreciate that oftentimes it's it's the people challenge there to, to kind of overcome and um, get everybody on board, right? Yeah, but it, but even if you look at you know an, an integrated care board, you know you've got seven, ten trusts or whatever in that. If you've got five different tool sets, all with different renewal dates um, yeah. and potentially different tiers of licensing and subscriptions that they've got, some might be on premise, some might be in the cloud. I mean, you know, just sort of um, consolidating that challenge <laughs> itself. 
suddenly I, I think I've started sweating. Um, so <laughs> let's move on to the next. The next yeah, let's, let's, let's take a different tack. Um, so, so customer customer experience, customer satisfaction. That, that's kind of a hot topic at the moment with XLAs coming coming more to the fore. Can you talk to us a bit, Chris, about kind of how Alemba is approaching that and, and what kind of mechanisms or features and functionalities that you guys have in place that help organizations understand, you know, how well the service is being provisioned or being received by, by ultimately the end users? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, a few different functions that are in the tool to gather feedback from uh, from users. You know, it's it's always a challenge. Uh, you know, sometimes if, you know get, getting getting feedback from users, no matter which avenue you kind of push it down, whether it's uh, you know sending out surveys on you know completion of jobs being done, to say mm -hmm. you know how was you, you know how how was how was your user experience with uh, with this? Um, uh, but sometimes you can get it from other metrics such as um you know if you're rolling out a new self-service portal for instance and you've done that you know how much adoption have you got in that self-service portal uh you know are, are you are you seeing a reduction in the number of phone calls and a increase in the number of you know users there you know have you rolled out a knowledge bank and are you seeing searches come through are you seeing knowledge bank articles being hit are there, are there any ratings on those on those items as well um so there's various can you know kind of statistics and metrics that you can use to Kind of have a look and evaluate you know kind of how are users finding the experience of not just the tool but you know the kind of the processes you know as a whole um and sometimes you know measuring the user experiences you know finding you know if there are kind of blockages in certain things because maybe something's wrong within the user experience there and you know nobody's nobody's maybe feeding back on it but you you notice those blockages in certain places and maybe it's a particular team maybe it's a particular task maybe it's some bit of configuration or automation that's missing for instance that you've got an opportunity to improve so yeah various different ways to to to, to look at that rather than just getting direct user feedback on asking the question of kind of did you have a good experience or not um you know because sometimes you'll get a um you know varying degrees of kind of optimism or pessimism depending on <laughs> you know sometimes even previous experience you know we you know you sometimes find you know if you've got a bad first experience from there it's really hard to rebuild that trust again um and you'll kind of you know lag down on those kind of metrics for quite a while so it's worth exploring some of those other you know kind of avenues of um information and analysis to see you know how how are people using the system and how do we want them to use the system and are they doing it in that way and are they doing it effectively efficiently and uh, you know, does that give us some indication as to whether they're having a good experience or not? And is, is that something you're actively engaging with your, your client base to kind of help them understand and drive that forward and, and sort of part of that CSI wrap? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, you know, various things that we have a look at when we're, you know, implementing any type of project is, you know, how are we going to, you know, report on or, you know, create some information and get some analytics out of this, out of the system. You know the, the the tools. You know any you know any any sort of tool is really good when you put information into it to get the information out to do the job that you need to do for that thing. But you know how are you going to use that information as a whole to be able to provide some sort of service improvement? You know, um, you know in IT, you for instance, success, we're, right? We're, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. We're, we're categorizing things by priority, which might do other things like set an SLA, but um, you know, categorizing, categorizing things like the oh, sorry, putting things like the category against a ticket, you know, you may be doing some sort of automation with that information. You may be doing some sort of service level agreement with it as well. Uh, but if you're not doing any of those things and you're not, you know, using it for searching or filtering or ordering your work or anything like that, then, you know, why are you even filling it out in the first place? It's just a field that you're filling out for the sake of filling it out. You know, you use that data for something uh, to be able to drive some decision making, you know, and it might give you some insight as to where, the user experience is not as good you know everything that gets sent into team a for instance is taking twice as long as when it goes into team b is that what a user expects or not you know for instance mm -hmm. um you know and it, it, it's funny you know i mean the, the xla is is one thing but even like service level agreements it's quite surprising about the um the number of organizations you know not just specifically nhs that really don't have the a part of sla they've got service levels but they haven't got an agreement with the customer about it it's just mm -hmm. it really just setting themselves a target that says oh we want to fix this by you know kind of in five working days 
but is that what the customer expects when they you know yeah. when they log when you know when they when they're getting in touch you know um so um so yeah so that's quite 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 interesting as well I agree with the point around uh, the A yeah. in SLA. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that's very valid indeed. So, so get your crystal ball out, Chris. Um, so, there's lots of change in the NHS, right? You mentioned earlier around an aging population. We um, wait eagerly for a budget in a couple of weeks, and you know maybe there's some more money directed to the I NHS. I wouldn't say eagerly. Well. It's slightly tongue in cheek, but you know that they, they they've been told that, that you know no extra funding without reform. So there's a challenge around that. Um, so how do you think things are going to change over the next few years? You know what what are you, I suppose the question is almost what are you expecting your customer organisations to be saying to you about their challenges over the, that that period of time? Yeah, so we so we've seen a bit of it already, and I expect it to continue in the future. And it is along the lines of the collaboration and integration between trust systems, you know, suppliers, um, uh, and things like that. You know, the you know the NHS has got you know a lot of information in all of its systems, and it's figuring out how to use that in the best way for patient care. If you you know if we're talking about kind of you know IT specifically and how they're going to you know improve the service from a you know from an underlying you know IT perspective. Um I think they I think there will be investment in IT. I think it'll be directed in you know particular ways. You know uh, I think there's there, there's talks of using and expanding the use of electronic um patient records. You know that really came to the forefront in COVID. You know before then you know, I go to the doctors and it would be, you know, dig around in a, you know, in a file to, you know, to pick yeah. out my my patient card or when I sign up for a new GP, you know, it takes, I don't know, you know, seven working days for them to, you know, to, to, to transfer the information across and things like that. So it's okay. getting that more efficient and faster, um, obviously more remote care. Uh, again, you know, quite a lot of this has kind of fallen out of the pandemic and just, just pushed everybody to react really quickly and we're just kind of you know rolling with the oh this is what you know this is working quite well for us you know being able to have uh you know more conversations like this be able to you know talk with a patient you know in a medium like this for instance you know you wouldn't have ever thought of before you know covid for instance um you know using more tools um for data and analytics uh you know clamping down on you know i think there'll be some more investment in security as well you know with some of the stuff that's happened uh you know recently with some of the um some of the some of the things but you know i don't want to um <laughs> tick the box and say the two letters that everybody's saying recently you know you can put your bingo card on which two letters uh, those are but you know we're at a conference lately and had a bit of a scorecard for how many times the uh the particular thing was mentioned. <laughs> yeah, a bit it's of a, it's cheered, a, sort of a but, nightmare uh, drinking game, isn't it? Because you'll be <laughs> hammered before the first ten minutes are up. Uh, uh, absolutely, <laughs> but you know, I mean, I mean, rightly so. I mean, some of the stuff it can do now is, you know, is it, you know, is unbelievable. Uh, you know, it, it, and it and it kind of just you know smashed through the front door and went, you know, hey, it's here. You know, yeah. I mean, everybody was kind of used to it to an extent where you know you were able to like you know ask your phone for the weather and you know turn your lights on and stuff like that but then you know when you know when this when this came through it was just um you know just, that it just is well and truly out of the bag isn't level. it yeah yeah for yeah. sure and it just it just evolved so fast from you know i mean i i do a little bit of tinkering with this kind of stuff with the you know amazon um uh, I, w I wouldn't say her name because there's one right next to me and it'll start doing all sorts of weird things <laughs> um you know just some kind of custom tinkering with that and you had to you know like program things in the back end with specific words and tell it intents and different ways that you might say different things so you really had to kind of you know program it to expect what you were going to say uh, whereas now you know you can speak to it in natural language and it'll come back you know with a response and you know there's there's things that it, need, it needs to do to improve it um you know because there's data regulatory problems with that there's uh you know accuracy problems with it um you know that that that, that need to get ironed out so th there's various different challenges in in that but i see it being used you know massively in the future for various different use cases but those use cases need to be well thought out people just are quite co quite commonly you know i speak to our customers on a daily basis and they're like oh so you know we we want to implement it and i'm like well 
but for what? What are you trying yeah. to solve with it? <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and there's various different things that we're looking into, you know, summarizing ticket histories, chatbots, um, you know, being able to just type in, you know, give me a report that shows, you know, how are we doing last month? You know, uh, what's our SLAs like, you know, instead of having to run manual reports, just kind of talk to it naturally. Um, so, yeah, so I see that being a, you know, kind of a big, a big driver in the future as well. But it, it's going to be something that obviously they need to be quite careful about because of the nature of the data that they deal with. Um, you know, and everybody, I think it's on every kind of data governance managers kind of, you know, <laughs> probably chalkboard right now to, to say, how are we going to deal with, you know, exposing this data to, uh, you know, to something like that. And um, uh, so, yeah. Yeah, huge, huge data privacy concerns around around that aspect, and um, it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out, and then you know how people then adopt it. Certainly within the healthcare space, the NHS being being a great example of that. Um, Chris, I mean that that's that's fantastic to hear from you and to, to understand a little bit more about Alemba. You know your experiences in the healthcare, both within the UK and further afield abroad. Um, very insightful. Thank you ever so much for your time. So I don't know if you've got anything to kind of add as a bit of a wrap up now, just for. No, no I, I would just um, say that it's been a great conversation, Chris. Thank you very much. I think that your experience, both yours and that of um, Alemba's, um, really, you know, shows that you un understand space. Um, my final word would be that um, AI presents so much opportunity oh you dropped healthcare. you dropped it in there yeah. we managed to get yeah, we absolutely. almost managed to get I, through without saying it uh, i had to sure anybody that give, didn't know <laughs> i had to give the funders at least one one tipple one, one quick sip yeah. exactly. but uh you know what an incredible opportunity that technology presents if we could take advantage of it right that's the um yeah. you know there's so many aspects of the nhs or healthcare generally that it could provide a real genuine revolution for but but that aside chris superb thank you ever so much for joining us thanks very much to our listeners for tuning in um chris if you'd if, if anybody would like to find out more about alemba to get in touch with chris and i'm sure he'll be able to either help you directly or point you to the appropriate person thanks all see you on the next episode Bye bye